Does anyone like the thought of going to the hospital? Outside of the happy life moments like the birth of a child, the thought of having to spend time in the hospital is not a pleasant one for many. Through some innovative new approaches, Peoria, Illinois-based OSF Healthcare is looking at ways to keep people out of the hospital while providing services that are typically hospital-based. It's new, it's pushing the limits of healthcare, and it's really, I don't know if it's the frontier, but it's really doing it safely and making sure patients, it's all about the patient. That's Dr. Matthew Gorman, Chief Medical Officer for OSF On Call. And I'm Shelley Dankoff, your host of Health Accelerated, brought to you by OSF Healthcare. On today's episode of Health Accelerated, we take a look at the growing trend to keep people out of the hospital and bring them the care that they need in the comfort of their own home. Joining me is Dr. Matthew Gorman. He's the Chief Medical Officer for OSF On Call. Thank you for joining us. So first of all, let's start with OSF On Call. What exactly is that? OSF On Call is our digital health entity for OSF Healthcare, and it's broken down into three different arms. The first is the clinical arm, and so that's our telehealth offering. So our telehospitalists in which our hospitalists are based in Peoria and care for patients throughout our ministry. And then we also have, that includes our tele-EICU in which our providers are monitoring patients in all our ICUs throughout the ministry. And then we also have our virtual visits, which is also part of that clinical arm where you can be seen in the comfort of your own home for urgent care needs. And then we also have probably most exciting right now is our hospital at home component where patients that are being admitted to our hospital at St. Francis have the opportunity to be cared for at home in the comfort of their home, in their own bed, in their slippers and robe, but then seen directly by one of our APPs, advanced practice providers that comes into the home and then overseen with our physicians virtually. So this is the 21st century version of the house call, isn't it? It is. So let's talk about what types of patients qualify for this. Is it everything or is it a broad range? We're working on to expand it to everyone, but currently under the pandemic waiver with COVID, this is for Medicare patients. There are also certain other insured patients that we cover that we're working through and trying to expand that and then working with the state government in terms of other payers to expand that to, to give it to everybody. But currently it's really adults only and really Medicare beneficiaries today. Are there particular kinds of health conditions that this is more targeted toward or that you see this patient come in and you say, oh, they would be a good candidate for that? If so, what are those? It's really about what can be safely cared for in the home. And so mainly this is infections of skin or cellulitis is also known as, and then really respiratory. So lung infections, COPD exacerbations, and then heart failure exacerbations can also be safely cared for at the home. It's not for every patient that has heart failure, but certain subtypes within that can be. And we have a clinical program that evaluates that. And then patients are given the option whether they want to be admitted to the bricks and mortar traditional or whether they are good. we see them as a good candidate that can be safely cared for in the comfort of their home. That must be an interesting conversation because, again, the population you're dealing with is older. And so older, they come in and they're like, well, you're going to admit me to the hospital with this. Or if they've had it for a long period of time, because many of these are chronic patients as well, correct? Correct. And so now all of a sudden you say, well, what if you could stay home? Tell me about those conversations and what that is like when you're going through that initially. And some of those, it's a learning process for us as well. We've had patients that are very energetic about the opportunity because they've been in the hospital and know that, you know, being in the hospital is not the best place to get rest and to recover. And our first patient that we took, actually, his first comment was that he overslept and was kind of surprised because he had multiple previous hospitalizations and was able to sleep in his own bed. And we did our kind of wake-up call later in the morning, not at four the morning. Um, And he just felt he got a great night's sleep. And so that's kind of the difference. And those are the things, stories we can tell patients. But it really is some patients don't want others to come into their home. That's a big change. But then others are very welcoming. Um, And I think that's kind of the magic of this is being in the home, doing, you know, the home visit, as you mentioned, in the 21st century. It's the opportunity to come into someone's home, which is really inviting. So is the APP coming on a daily visit on a daily basis to visit them or how often does that happen? 
So someone will visit, nurses will be in the home every day, at a minimum of twice a day. And then our advanced practice providers will be in on days one and three. And then our physicians will be doing virtual home visits through kind of an iPad per se and visually inspecting and having the conversations with the patient daily. So now we're talking technology too. Again, a population that may or may not be comfortable with it. So walk me through what that process is like to make sure You know, you need the blood pressure cuff. You need, you know, those various other things in the home. Tell me about what that is like and how that setup goes. And so we do talk about the technology, although by far and away, most patients are, I mean, there's some that just, and my dad is one of those that is probably refractory to technology and only uses it he has to in terms of FaceTiming and he just got into texting. But most patients are, have some aptitude for technology, but there are some that just aren't there. But the technology is very easy to use. Um, it's really push button. And then there's a device that they can wear on their arm that they can push and activate. And so the, there's there's really safeguards in place to make it. You don't have to be a techie to enjoy this and, and reap the benefits. You just have to be open-minded. And I think that's probably the big thing that we stress is that it's about a comfort of being at home and that we wrap around um, the healthcare around you. And so the technology is just the little interface, but it's really not the sticking point. Yes, they have to be able to turn it on and some basic requirements, but it really doesn't take a PhD in computer science to, to use it. How about other family members? Because obviously this affects, I mean, I see it as a great resource if you are perhaps a widow or a widower and you don't have others who can come in and help you. So there's that side of it. But probably more often you have, you know, a spouse or an, another caregiver there. Is there this whole education that takes place for everybody that helps put their mind at ease more? It does. And we're able to care for the family better. You actually get to see how they interact at home. And I think that opens up other conversations. You get to actually I mean see what's in their medicine cabinet. You get to see the medications that haven't been, you know, have been canceled, but no one throws it out because they might need it and causes medication confusion. You also just you get kind of see them in their own environment. They just relax and can be more receptive to the information given. And so there's a really benefit that we actually care for the whole family and the care team that's around the patient, you know, 365, not just while they're in the hospitalization component. So first of all, how many patients have been enrolled and how many have been working through this? And then what's their reaction been? Uh, Our numbers, we started out just six weeks ago and we're over 15 patients that have been actively um, cared for and successfully discharged. Their reactions have been amazing. And so they've really enjoyed being in, in, and most of these have been, have had other comparatives. So they know what previous hospitalizations have been. And they just see the joy of being in their own home, waking up, being in their, um, not being separated from their loved ones, having their loved ones come to their home rather than having to drive either across the river in some cases and having to kind of park their car and, you know, be able to navigate St. Francis to be able to, to see their loved ones. And so they're able to just, you know, roll over and, you know, see their wife of 65 years. And so, I mean, those are some of the benefits that are intangibles that it's really hard to, when you're trying to talk about this program, that you can't come up with every unique situation that there are. They get to not be separated from their pets. And I think as we find, you know, pets relationships, some people love their pet more than they love their family member and don't want to be separated um, or don't have someone that they feel comfortable to care for them. And so those are some of the unique benefits that this program has. Now they have to be able to make sure their pets are safe and secure for our safety of our mission partners that go into the home. But far and away, it's been a very great experience for the caregiver as well as the patients. So after you've been admitted, then is it a traditional discharge as well? Yes. So the I'll go kind of over the admission, which is a little bit unique, because they're in St. Francis Emergency Department, felt to be a suitable candidate to be admitted to the hospital at which our team comes and uh, does an evaluation whether we feel that they'll be a good candidate for the program, that they can be safely treated in their home. And then patients are offered the opportunity to enroll, um, and then patients consent to it. And then we arrange for an ambulance to come and pick them up and then deliver them to their home and if they need any necessary medical equipment. And then we also have a tech kit that comes out in which we walk through them and then our nurses come out and see them. And then our on day the first day, um, our physicians would then remote in after all that's been occurred. And then we 
continue however long the course of care Correct. takes place. And then what happens on the discharge end of things? So on the discharge end, our physicians will go through as well as our nurses in terms of the medications. And if there's new prescriptions, go through that and kind of really with our pharmacist team, because our pharmacists actually do remote visits as well with them and really do a comprehensive medication reconciliation, but also being able to see with our members that are going in the home to kind of see what all medications there are, all the home medications, which sometimes just gets forgotten about. They don't have them on, on them. So they forget that they've been taking cinnamon or they've been, you know, taking magnesium or, you know, there's a prescription that their farm, you know, their doc of, you know, even three or six months ago that may or may not be in the system that they're on. And so there have been some insights found. But then it, it's the traditional in terms of the nurse goes through the discharge instructions and then a file appointment is made up. And so the transition back to the home care in terms of be, making sure they're successful and, you know, don't have to use our resources of coming back to the hospital. This sounds like this would be, we, we serve a number of rural areas, rural communities, and knowing what services are available, and it's, some, it's tough. Well, let's be honest. It's tough to get some of those services in our smaller communities. This sounds like a good fit. Is that some of what you're hoping to see or expand into? Right now, it's it, it's limited to Peoria and kind of the tri-county area. So think of that as kind of our geography. Our plan is to expand. Um, again, it's making sure that patients can be cared for safely because if there are any medical needs arise, we have a rapid response team that deploys within 30 minutes to be able to safely see them. And so those are some of the considerations as we get more in the rural area that we just have to make sure we can safely care for patients should their condition worsen. And sometimes that happens with even in, in a bricks and mortar, you know, patients' conditions worsen and they have to go to the ICU. And that still can happen in, in, in our best prognosticator in terms of what, how we feel that they may get worse and they may have to come back to the hospital. Let's flip sides to the mission partners, our employees who are providing this care. It's a different type of caregiving. You may not learn this. What, what's been that conversation in getting people to participate and be the caregivers from our end of things in the program? It's been a great, pleasant surprise. I mean, initially there was some resistance of how can you do this and is, can we do it safely? And we've kind of overcome that and, and shown that we can. And now we're reaping the benefits of being able to see the, the joys of healthcare, of being able to go into someone's home where they're excited to see you and where they, you know, have their dog and, you know, they're baking you muffins and, and kind of you're part of the family. And so I think for our for our nurses that are going to the home, they're just – they're, that the joy in medicine is coming back. For our clinicians going into the home, either virtually or in person, they have a sense of accomplishment and just feel like, you know, this is cool again. They love medicine and it's kind of reopening careers that may have been with the pandemic and all the frustration or burnout and people potentially lose, I mean, losing the spark for healthcare. This is kind of re-energized and it's going to help with our recruiting because people actually enjoy coming to work. And so I think, and that just helps just the care delivery, because if you enjoy what you do, it's really not working. And so I think that we're finding is that they love going out to the to the homes. They love going and talk to the, the extended family. And so that's where I think the spark and you see kind of the twinkle in their eyes when they come back and the excitement that they have of just caring for patients again. So it's not a special skill set, any more specialized than, again, being a nurse, a doctor, of any sort. I would say that there definitely is a special skill set. It, it, it's in terms of the comfort of thinking in a different way um, of approaching that. I mean, you don't have all the resources that you have. And so you definitely have to be a little bit different in terms of if you're used to everything right next to you, you're not going to have all that armamentarium in, in close proximity. And so it's comfort and ability to kind of critically think, and every condition can be a little bit different. And so it is a little bit elevated skill set of making sure, and it's not for everybody, just because it's, you know, going into someone's home is a much different component than going into someone's room and you're kind of a guest in their home. You're still a guest and caring for the patients, but it's just a much different sense when you're going into someone's home. We like to talk about innovative approaches and this, you know, when you started practicing medicine all those years ago, you know, you'd like to look in that crystal ball and say, this is the way healthcare is going. Could you have predicted all of this and 
Is it exciting for you personally as a physician to see this? If, if I said I could predict this, I would be totally off. If COVID taught me anything, I, I mean, I think it taught me that I don't know anything about prediction because it, in terms of I just never thought it would go on this long or, you know, what what are, I mean, of how it's kind of a national phenomenon. It, everything's kind of been regional before. And just I think how we have approached things, it's kind of been a regional if there's been critical shortages rather than kind of a globe, you know, affecting the whole country and all the regions. And so I think that's kind of where we kind of have grown and evolved. But this totally makes me excited. There's just, it's new, it's pushing the limits of healthcare. And it's really, I don't know if it's the frontier, but it's really doing it safely and making sure patients, it's all about the patient. And it's putting the patient at the center, which I think sometimes we've kind of evolved from. And I think we talk about the patient in the center, but really the, it's everything the patient is and then we wrap around. It's kind of a bubble wrap in terms of making sure the patient does well and has good communication skills and can kind of then, when there are issues, there's, there's a team that's kind of focused on that of how we can do this for the patient. And I think that's what energized me and makes me want to expand this and talk to whoever wants to listen just because it is a novel concept. But at the heart of it, it's basically what the sisters did, you know, over 130 years ago in terms of providing care to patients where they could get it. And I mean, that was down, you know, on Adams, but now we're going into the homes and I mean, it, it is a great experience being able to kind of come, we come in virtually as physicians, but hearing our our team that goes in and comes back, you hear the excitement of them, and that gets me energized. You talk about speaking to anyone who will listen to that point. You made a trip out to talk to lawmakers and kind of take this to them and show them in Washington, D.C., hey, this is the future, but we need your help. Explain why that was necessary. Well, government right now is at a standstill in some things, but at the the heart of it is that this is good patient care. It's cost effective, which we need to make sure from CMS perspective is they need to be make sure that we can do this and not overspend. And so that was probably one of the big questions for every lawmaker is can we do this cost effectively? And we've shown that we can. And then the other big question they have is, is it equitable? And health equity is significant. And so I think that's probably the big thing that we're working to overcome Geography is going to be an issue, and I think we're showing that we can do it in in our geography, which is different than many other markets where it's being done. We do want to be able to do it safely in rural markets, but it's going to take us some time to actually create the capacity to have other that we can deploy around the patient. But I I think we're all energized to do this, but it's really about educating them on healthcare and the needs that that I mean telehealth, you know, was really restricted pre-COVID. And then with COVID, it expanded immensely. And I think they, patients enjoy it and they like it. And I mean, there's some that's not for everybody, but for a new majority, it is. And I think those are the patients that we're going to work on to kind of develop this care model for them. So what lies ahead? What, what's coming down the road other than the continued development into those other areas? What's the next biggest and greatest? Well, first, we need to make sure that this has um, longevity. So, I mean, our biggest, I mean, right now is um, getting the program up and running and doing it safely is probably the first priority. And then making sure that the government responds and, and passes an appropriate bill so that it is. It's currently passed the House and just waiting for the Senate to take action. Um, and I think that will give us some security as the, the bill that's in for is for another two years for telehealth to be supported. And then along that is expansion. And so I think we want this program to expand. We want our clinicians to embrace telehealth and educate patients. And so it, it's not only educating my colleagues that this is a safe venue, but it's also educating your patients that this is a safe. And so I think that's kind of where things are. And where the future is going to go, I can tell you one thing that I've learned is that I'm not exactly sure, but I want to be part of it. And with that, I think that's a great way to wrap up the conversation because there is so much excitement in the future. Dr. Matthew Gorman, thank you so much for joining us to talk about the possibilities and what already exists. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Health Accelerated, brought to you by OSF Healthcare. Listen and subscribe on your favorite podcast app. You can also find links to any of our episodes on the OSF Newsroom at newsroom.osfhealthcare.org.